This is the third video in this series on hemostasis and is part two of the discussion of normal physiology, specifically covering the topics of secondary hemostasis and fibrinolysis. The learning objectives of this video are first, to be able to describe the general features of the coagulation cascade, second, to be able to list the antithrombotic control mechanisms which terminate clot propagation, next, to describe the process of fibrinolysis, then to describe the role of vitamin K in coagulation, and last, to diagram the interrelationship between platelet plug formation and the coagulation cascade. So here is the overview of hemostasis we saw in the first two videos of the series. In this video, I'll essentially be discussing the right half of the screen, that is, everything from the coagulation cascade downstream. As with platelet activation, it's easy to get lost in the many specific details of the coagulation cascade. But first, let's begin with a few general principles. The coagulation cascade is a series of enzymatic conversions of inactive proenzymes, also known as zymogens, to activated enzymes. For example, and these are not the actual enzyme names, but just for illustration, imagine activated enzyme A comes along and induces a conformational change in proenzyme B, thus activating it. Then activated enzyme B might cleave something off of a proenzyme C, activating that, and maybe activated protein C then requires a cofactor of some kind in order to activate proenzyme D. And then comes along an inactivating enzyme which binds to enzyme D, preventing its action. Each step along the way gets multiplied in that each copy of enzyme A might activate 100 copies of enzyme B, and each copy of activated enzyme B might activate 100 copies of enzyme C, and each enzyme C might activate 100 copies of enzyme D. So from one molecule of activated enzyme A, we end up with 1 million molecules of activated enzyme D. This process is what is known as the cascade. Its initial trigger is normally vessel wall injury. It ends with the formation of fibrin strands and the termination of the cascade by various antithrombotic mechanisms. Remembering from before, it requires a careful balance between procoagulants and anticoagulants. Too much procoagulants and spontaneous clotting will occur, resulting in deep venous thromboses and pulmonary emboli. Too much anticoagulants and excessive bleeding and hemorrhaging will occur. Finally, the process of fibrinolysis eventually dissolves the clot. We saw this table briefly in the first video of the series. It demonstrates that most clotting factors in the cascade are designated with a Roman numeral, in addition to having one or more alternative names. The clotting factors are almost always known by the Roman numeral, with the exception of factors 1 through 4, which are always referred to by their names, fibrinogen or fibrin, prothrombin or thrombin, tissue factor, and of course calcium. A lowercase a after the Roman numeral designates the active form of the factor. Most activated factors are enzymes, with the major exceptions being 1a, commonly known as fibrin, 5a, and 8a. The traditional model of coagulation was first described in the 1960s as a means to explain lab findings when studying the process of coagulation in vitro, that is, in test tubes outside of the body. It was not necessarily intended originally to be a description of the processes actually occurring in the body. However, since it provided a relatively straightforward way to visualize a highly complex system and allowed one to understand abnormal results of coagulation tests, clinicians rapidly adopted it. It consists of parallel extrinsic and intrinsic pathways, so-called based on whether or not the trigger was a compound that was extrinsic or intrinsic to the endothelium. The extrinsic pathway involves an integral membrane glycoprotein called tissue factor, along with clotting factors uh, 7 and 10. The intrinsic pathway involves clotting factors 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. The end result of both of these is the common pathway, which involves factor 10 along with thrombin and fibrin. Unfortunately, this traditional description is no longer believed to be the most accurate model of the physiology. 
it nonetheless is still widely taught in textbooks and university lectures. It's not that the traditional model is literally wrong, but rather that it is an oversimplification whose division into these distinct extrinsic and intrinsic pathways is artificial. In addition, it ignores the distinct phases of coagulation and has not typically included a thorough discussion of essential multi-component complexes. In the contemporary model of the coagulation cascade, there are four key multi-component complexes, each of which consists of an activated clotting factor enzyme, a cofactor, and the enzyme substrate. The first is called the extrinsic factor 10-ACE and is composed of activated factor 7, tissue factor, and inactivated factor 10. The intrinsic factor 10-ACE is composed of activated factor 9, activated factor 8, and inactivated factor 10. The prothrombinase complex is composed of activated factor 10, activated factor 5, and prothrombin. And last, the protein C complex is composed of thrombin, thrombomodulin, and inactivated protein C. These complexes are assembled on an anionic phospholipid surface for which calcium is required. The contemporary model's most important distinction from the traditional one is the central importance of tissue factor as a primary trigger for the whole cascade. Tissue factor is a membrane glycoprotein expressed in vascular adventitia. During the initiation phase, when it's exposed by vessel injury, it binds to factor 7, which is then activated. The tissue factor activated 7 complex, which combines with factor 10 on the plasma membrane, forms the first of the four key multi-component complexes, which is referred to as the extrinsic tenase. The extrinsic tenase activates factor 10, which then binds to activate at factor 5 to form the prothrombinase complex, which in turn converts a small amount of prothrombin into thrombin. Although there is a small magnification effect, as each extrinsic tenase can activate many copies of factor 10, and each activate at factor 10 can activate many copies of thrombin, the amount of thrombin produced from the initiation phase is still insufficient to lead to significant generation of fibrin threads and thus a blood clot. For this, there is the amplification phase. The limited amount of thrombin produced so far activates more factor 5 as well as factor 8 and 11, while the 7A tissue factor complex, as well as activated factor 11, is able to activate factor 9. Activated factor 9 binds to activated factor 8, which then forms the intrinsic factor 10ase, thus activating 10. The amplification effect at each step is such that the intrinsic tenase ends up activating as much as 100 times the factor 10 that is activated by the extrinsic tenase. Each activated factor 10 converts more prothrombin to thrombin, which in turn further accelerates the amplification process until there is a virtual explosion of thrombin generation. Von Willebrand factor, which we encountered in the last video on platelet activation, plays a key role in the amplification phase as it binds to inactive factor 8 that is circulating in the bloodstream, greatly increasing its half-life. In the final steps, thrombin converts fibrinogen, both that which is circulating and that which has been recently released by activated platelets, to fibrin. Soluble fibrin monomers spontaneously polymerize into relatively weak threads. Factor 13A, which is also activated by thrombin, then cross-links and strengthens the overlapping fibrin strands. The cross-linked fibrin, which forms a three-dimensional mesh in which red blood cells and platelets become trapped, represents the final step in the conventional coagulation cascade. Referring back to the traditional model of coagulation for a moment, although it has some limitations, it will be helpful to know that the traditionally described extrinsic pathway, also known as the tissue factor pathway, incorporates these steps. The intrinsic pathway, also known as the contact activation pathway, incorporates these steps. And the so-called common pathway includes everything that's left. Now there are several factors which have been historically included in the coagulation cascade in addition to what I've already mentioned, uh, specifically the intrinsic pathway upstream of factor 11, which I've decided to not include in the diagram.
Those are factor 12, calicreon, and something called high molecular weight caninogen. While they have been identified in the lab as having a role in coagulation, I haven't listed them here because defects of these proteins do not result in a clinically apparent clotting disorder. For me, this raises doubt that these factors play any significant role in actual physiology. To prevent either spontaneous or runaway intravascular coagulation, there are three main antithrombotic control mechanisms. The first is antithrombin, formerly known as antithrombin-3, which is a serine protease inhibitor that inactivates thrombin, as well as factors 7, 9, 10, and 11. Binding to heparin, either endogenous or exogenous, greatly increases antithrombin's protease activity, though the physiologic role of heparin as an endogenous antithrombotic mechanism is unclear. The second antithrombotic control mechanism is the protein C pathway. In this, an integral membrane protein of the endothelium, called thrombomodulin, induces a conformational change in thrombin. The altered thrombin is incapable of activating platelets or converting fibrinogen to fibrin, but can now activate a proenzyme called protein C. Activated protein C, in association with its cofactor, protein S, inactivates factors 5 and 8, inhibiting the function of the prothrombinase and intrinsic factor tenase complexes, respectively. The last antithrombotic control mechanism is tissue factor pathway inhibitor. This is a single-chain polypeptide which can reversibly inhibit factor 10, as well as the 7A tissue factor complex. A small amount of tissue factor pathway inhibitor circulates in the bloodstream, while most is found attached to the microvascular endothelium. So what is the final end result of this incredibly complex series of reactions, starting with platelet adhesion and including platelet activation and secretion, platelet aggregation, the coagulation cascade, polymerization of fibrin, and last, the antithrombotic control mechanisms? It's this. This is a colorized scanning electron micrograph of a thrombus or blood clot. Red blood cells are obvious. The irregular gray blobs are platelet aggregates. The green cell right in the middle is a white blood cell. And the hundreds of brown strands into which the cells are entangled are fibrin. For me, seeing a picture like this really emphasizes what an amazing process hemostasis is. As amazing as clot formation is, we don't necessarily want blood clots to hang around forever. Eventually, we need our blood vessels to become patent again. Clots are eventually removed by the body in the process of fibrinolysis. There are two major steps. First, plasminogen, which is a circulating proenzyme, is activated by conversion to plasmin by one of two similar enzymes, tissue type plasminogen activator, also known as TPA, which is secreted from vascular cells and itself activated by thrombin, or urinary type plasminogen activator, also known as urokinase or UPA, which is secreted from a variety of cell types. Plasmin then cleaves cross-linked fibrin, essentially severing the fibrin threads holding the blood clot together. This results in a variety of fragments known formally as fibrin degradation products, one of which is the D-dimer, which is composed of two D domains from adjacent fibrin monomers, which are linked together. The D-dimer will be important when discussing certain pathologic conditions, such as disseminated intravascular coagulation, as it can only be produced by plasmin cleaving fibrin, and thus its presence indicates intravascular clotting. In addition to fibrin, plasmin also cleaves fibrinogen and several other clotting factors. As with the main coagulation cascade, fibrinolysis has additional levels of regulation. Specifically, three inhibitors. The first is plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, which as its name implies, inactivates TPA and UPA. Then there is alpha-2 antiplasmin, which inactivates plasmin. And finally, thrombin activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor, which actually acts on fibrin, by cleaving the end C-terminal residues, which are important for the normal action of plasmin.
In other words, it makes fibrin relatively resistant to degradation. The final topic to discuss is the important role that vitamin K plays in the coagulation cascade. In fact, the K of vitamin K is derived from coagulations vitamin, which is the German word for clotting vitamin. There are multiple types of naturally occurring vitamin K. Vitamin K1, also known as phyloquinone, is found in green vegetables with the highest concentration in spinach, kale, collard greens, and Brussels sprouts. In addition, there is vitamin K2, known as menaquinone, which is synthesized from vitamin K1 by normal gut bacteria. There are many similar forms of vitamin K2, which are named after the number of double bonds present on the side chain, which can become quite long. Vitamin K is fat soluble and requires intact biliary and pancreatic function for effective absorption. The role of vitamin K is to act as a coenzyme in the post-translational modification of several clotting factors, specifically prothrombin factors 7, 9, and 10, as well as protein C and protein S. It aids in the carboxylation of glutamic acid residues to form gamma carboxyglutamyl residues, which allows the proteins to bind to calcium and thus allows them to be activated. Deficiency of vitamin K can lead to clinically significant bleeding. This is seen in a variety of conditions, most notably malabsorption syndromes. Vitamin K deficiency is also common in newborns, leading to a higher risk of bleeding in the first week of life. This is due to a combination of an immature liver that cannot effectively utilize vitamin K, relative lack of vitamin K in breast milk, and a sterile gut devoid of vitamin K synthesizing bacteria. Thus, parenteral vitamin K is typically administered at birth. So that concludes our grand overview of normal hemostasis. Let me return to this diagram once more. The very first reaction to vascular injury is vasoconstriction, followed by platelet activation, which is largely mediated by exposure of collagen. Platelet activation results in a change in platelet shape, platelet aggregation mediated largely by von Willebrand factor and fibrinogen, and results in the platelet plug. This phase of hemostasis is called primary hemostasis. The second phase of hemostasis is largely triggered by exposure of tissue factor during vascular injury, which triggers the coagulation cascade, the end result of which is thrombin's conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrin polymerizes, generating fibrin strands, which are superimposed on the platelet plug, and trap red blood cells to form a blood clot. This is secondary hemostasis. There are many critical points at which the platelets and coagulation cascade rely on one another. In addition, there are important antithrombotic control mechanisms which prevent both spontaneous intravascular coagulation as well as runaway coagulation in response to actual injury. And finally, the enzyme plasmin is responsible for cleavage of the fibrin strands and eventual clot degradation. That concludes part two of the normal physiology of hemostasis. If you found this video to be interesting and helpful, please remember to like it and share it with your colleagues and classmates. The next video in this series will discuss lab tests of hemostasis.